Salutations, fellow geekers. Thanks for joining me today. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Feel free to comment down below. Now let's get into it. Warning, viewer discretion is advised. Some of this video's content is unsuitable for children and even for some adults. So please proceed with caution and consider this your fair warning. Watch this student as he runs across the gym on this video footage. Seems fine. But then... From the lounge high school now, there's a dead, dead body out here. The next day, he was found dead, rolled up in a gym mat, supposedly reaching for his shoe? Yeah, okay, sure. The evidence that we found that this is not a murder, um, it appears just to be a terrible, terrible tragedy that resulted in a young man losing his life. This is the disturbing and puzzling case of 17-year-old Kendrick Johnson, who went missing on January 10th, 2013, and was found the next day upside down in a rolled up wrestling mat that was vertically upright in his school gym. Kendrick's favorite color was red, but little did he know that in his death, there will be red flags riddled all over his case. But let's start from the beginning, shall we? Kendrick Lamar Johnson, also known as KJ, was born on October 10, 1995, to parents Kenneth and Jackie Johnson in Valdosta, Georgia, where they have deep roots. Now, his home dynamic was very family-oriented. He has other siblings, which were older brothers Irvin and Kenneth Jr., older sister Kenyatta, and younger sister Kenya. I couldn't find a good picture of Kenya, but I did find this, and apparently KJ and Kenya shared the same birthday and were exactly a year apart. And what I thought was really interesting is Jackie explains that all of her kids have the initials K and J in their name, and it's kind of cool that even her husband's name is Kenneth and she's Jackie. And one more fun fact, the reason they did K's and J's is for the saying King Jesus. KJ was a student at Lowndes High School, home of the Vikings, but he wasn't just any student, he was actually a triathlete. KJ was a track runner and a basketball player, but his true passion was football and dreamed of being in the NFL. He played safety, but he hit like a linebacker. His basketball number was 25 and his football number was lucky number seven. His friends would describe him as quiet yet kind, and his parents would just rave about him, stating he was just the perfect son everyone would want. He would focus on school, sports, and he had goals for his future. He was just a normal, great young man. But on January 10th, 2013, Jackie Johnson knew something was off. She spoke with KJ that day, just like every day she would to see what he was doing. KJ said he was going to a freshman basketball game after school, and he'll be home after that. He had a 10 o'clock curfew, but he knew better than to break it on a school night. Now, 10 o'clock came and went, so Jackie got worried and drove down to the high school to maybe see if he was still around there. And shortly after midnight, she reported him missing. 911, where's your emergency? Yes, I'm calling my son. Um, son didn't come home from school today, and he still hasn't gotten here. Hey, what's your son's name? Kendrick Johnson. Kenneth, KJ's dad, is a truck driver, so he was actually in Pennsylvania at the time. So he told Jackie to just go down to the school first thing. And honestly, she didn't really sleep that night, so she was there between 8 and 8.30. She went to the front and asked if anyone has seen KJ or heard from him, and really just wanted to get the word out and print some flyers about him being missing. Jackie was there for a while, so about 10.30 in the morning, a lot of people started gathering around the gym doors apparently, and KJ's sister even tried to get in, but she couldn't. 
Jackie heard about all of this and asked one of the resource officers at the school if that was her son that they found in the gym, assuming that's what was going on, and the resource officer said yes. That very moment, she knew that Kendrick was dead. She started screaming and crying, which is totally valid. Now, I'm going to warn my viewers of major discretion at this point. These next clips and scenes are not for the faint at heart. If you wish to pass this part, just go to the seven minute mark. I've been wasting my time. I don't know why I can't get you out my mind. Yeah, now I'm so lost. Where do I go? I was in a chase, caught a flat on road. It was all love, ex no o. I was feeling rich, but we turned out bro. North Pole, life so cold. Lukewarm love, just took it to the stove. You were bad, news all kind, no pro. We grew apart fast. I guess we was reaping what we sold. I guess we was unequally old. Guess if we was putting on the show. Guess we should've tried to take it slow Guess I let my feelings take control Guess I let my demon take the will Used to think that we'd be growing old Now I can't believe that it was real It was back in late December when I did it I just wish I could forget it Cause I hate how much I love it Oh, I hate how I just love to catch a feeling me that you understood the gravity, but now I know you didn't. I guess it's better just to live it and forget it than to live it and remember. found nothing to indicate this was anything other than just a tragic accident. KJ's parents did not object for their son's death to be hidden from the public view. They actually encouraged others to take a look to really understand that it was far from an accident what had happened to him and really have an outcry for his justice. Now here's some accelerated video footage of the hallway to the gym that he was found in and it shows seven male students entering around the same time that KJ does. Take a good look at when he arrives right around this stage and you see these other students looking at him. I will say, the three males that are entering after him are very suspicious to me. The way that they look at him and just follow him right after him. Now, I have been up really late every night reading police reports and everything I can on the case online and even requested documents myself, but there's no names because they're all underage minors, but I would really like to know who these people are. So as you can see again, replaying it, as he arrives, you know, these kids are staring him down and watching him as he's going into the gym, they're, but they're not really like buddy buddies. I found some interesting footage. This is Kendrick during lunch. He's in the cafeteria getting in line and nobody bothers him except his friend that kind of nudges him a little bit. And here we are. This is 1.26 in the afternoon. This is him leaving his C-wing class to go to the other side of the school, as you can see his way, and to get to his weightlifting class that he was absent for in the old gym. As he's turning the corner, you'll see his yellow folder and he smiles at some friends and he seems fine. He doesn't seem like any distress. And then he's just walking and walking. He doesn't stop to talk to anyone and I don't really notice anyone following him either. He's passing the B-wing stairs and now he's entering into the hallway that goes to the other hallway to the old gym. Now he seems happy here. I can see that he's kind of like doing something with his hands and maybe like listening to music. And here we are again at this one spot. Now, the timestamp right here, we're gonna go over. It says 12.59, you'll notice. Now, there are six servers in the entire school that this video cameras are on, but there are three that are on at this area. And each one, they kind of have a different timestamp on. But when he enters here, it's actually 1.27 p.m. 
but on this server, it's gonna say 1.09 p.m. Keep in mind there are different timestamps because they are on different servers, but then he goes out of the picture, then he's never seen again. Now remember those three boys that went in after him? Where did the three boys go? So let's review how the cameras are located. So we just reviewed G9 as they were going into the gym after KJ. Then we saw a glimpse of G5 as KJ was running, kind of just jogging through the gym to the corner where the mats are where his body was found. Let's review G7's video footage. At the very bottom right hand corner, keep an eye out for KJ. He's in his white shirt running in and out very quickly. I'll just say this, it is super confusing between all of the servers being off track and all the different timestamps and he really did get into the gym around 1.26 to 1.27 p.m. and I know it mentions 1.09 and then the other servers will say like 1.15. So this G7 footage is actually two different times being put into one footage. At first, when I started seeing this, I had a feeling that maybe these boys could have been one, two, or even all three of the three boys that walked in after him. But when I looked at the timestamps, these boys playing basketball is at 1.16 p.m. So the confusion to me is, is it really 1.16 or was it 10 minutes off? So it still leaves me puzzled where I can't find these boys anywhere else. And I was hoping that these were them, but it's a different timestamp. Anyways, let's go over the video footage. So there was over 1900 hours for the last 48 hours of videos that they had requested. One of the biggest red flags in KJ's case was the fact that there was over two hours worth of surveillance, unaccounted for. Can you say red flag? Let's go over all of that, shall we? So the four cameras in the gym. The first camera records all the way up until 12.04 p.m. Then it stops, and then it starts again at 1.09 p.m. Then the second camera captures footage up until 11.05 p.m. And then it starts again over two hours later, up until 1.15 p.m. Then the third camera also drops at 11.05 p.m. and starts again at 1.16 p.m. Then the fourth camera goes up until 12.04 p.m. and then no recording for more than an hour, then picks up at 1.09 p.m. Those files are not original files. They're not something that an investigator should rely on for the truth of the video. Uh, they've been altered in a number of ways, primarily in image quality uh, and likely in dropped information, information loss, there are also a number of files that are corrupted because they've not been processed correctly and they're not playable. So um, I can't say why they were done that way, but they were not done correctly and they were not done um, thoroughly. Grant Fredericks was also asked a very interesting question. He said, do you think it's a coincidence the period of time in the gym is missing? And this is his response. Oh boy. Investigators are always suspicious and should be suspicious. And it's suspicious that that time period is not, not there. Um, so yes, I, I would be suspicious. Uh, and until I have the digital video system in my hand, until I can say or an investigator can say, everything is intact, this was what's recorded, I would still be highly suspicious of this. Don't be suspicious. Don't tell me suspicious. Don't tell me don't be suspicious. 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 Now, I know I'm not alone when I'm confused about the discrepancies in all of these videos. So I reached out to the Lowndes County Sheriff's Department and I was directed to Captain Stride Jones. He was kind enough with the time that he had to answer one of my questions about the video surveillance having the discrepancies of the time gone. And this is his response. Uh, what was determined is once he moves out of the range of the camera, it stops recording because it's not, it's not a true motion, it's motion activated. Mm -hmm. And it starts and stops by movement in the pixelation. Okay. And I'm thinking 
if those timestamps at the G5 and 6 are really 115, is that the server that's 10 minutes or 20 minutes behind? Do you remember that? No, ma'am, I don't. What was interesting to me in our short conversation from that day was he didn't really understand fully how that worked. And I was still really confused, so I decided to dig a little deeper. So remember Grant Fredericks, the forensic video analyst that was interviewed by CNN? Well, I reached out to him and he was kind enough to call me back. We spoke for about 30 minutes between two different times and I have it all recorded, but I'm not gonna bore you with 30 minutes of a conversation. I will go over what he responded to Basically, I was asking him the same question, and he was able to say what he thinks, not in an absolute sense, but what he thinks may have been the way it was programmed or the way it should have been programmed because he's been doing this for a very long time and has reviewed other cases in schools. I told him how I spoke to Captain Jones and how I was still confused about it all and what Captain Jones had said. And this will be his response, but keep in mind, what Grant Fredericks got was not the original files. He actually re-clarifies that and states, you know, I can't really tell the whole truth because he doesn't know. And that's what he always wanted was the true files. So the CNN interview that he did back then, years ago, that was based on copies that were altered. Now, I know that confuses a lot of people and I now understand because what they received was through a FOIA request. It wasn't the actual original files. He says also that they probably wouldn't have gotten the files they requested now if they did it today. But they said, you know, somebody probably mentioned that, yeah, they should probably get it, but we're not going to give them everything. So based on that, let's hear what he has to say on how it was probably programmed. They might say, let's encode 30 images per second if that motion is detected between these hours on that camera, mm -hmm. right? So the DVR, the digital video recording system, has a limited, a finite number of images per second that it can acquire from all the cameras total. So as soon as it starts to allocate more samples, more images per second from one camera, it has to deallocate sampling from other cameras. So the activity in the gym over lunchtime might might not have been as a priority as all the cameras in the lunch room and so the lunch room sensitivity settings would cause all of those cameras to start encoding at a much much higher frame rate which would naturally result in the gym cameras not encoding anything because they're not a priority perhaps right mm -hmm. so that's one explanation that could have occurred I, I think it's it's un, it's unusual that they wouldn't have they wouldn't want to have mo, you know uh, cameras recording in the gym when anybody's in there because that's a high risk area. Exactly because of injury and so things like that. Yeah, so it's that's unusual. But if you if one were to look at the hard drives that were acquired during the investigation, which I believe they still exist then one could go through and examine the question of motion sensitivity and define whether there's been any editing or been any nefarious mm, um, activity okay. in the drive. I, frankly, I doubt it. I think that it just wasn't thoroughly examined. And, and because it wasn't thoroughly examined, those questions arise, but those questions are still alive today. Exactly. Had, it been, you know, had those drives been provided, I think, for all of the drives been provided and proper examination done, then those answers would have been, you know, those questions would have been answered seven, eight years ago, and they wouldn't be still alive today. I agree. I think it's all in that blacked out footage that we're needing answers. Well, yeah, it could be. I mean, I would refer to it as blacked out footage because that means that it's a uh, footage was captured, the images were captured and then deleted. That's not the case. Okay. If, if you know what if what I'm suggesting um, happened, then that's not the case. The images the cameras simply weren't activated because of other priorities on the system. That's one you know, that's one plausible explanation. Interesting.
So the timestamps, that's what's really confusing people then because the footage of the kids going in and out before and after him, there should be motion censored. Kind of where I'm just stuck at. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I get you, and I, I, I share that confusion. Um, it, it could be that during the time, as I said, on DVR one when mm -hmm. the kids went into the gym, it met that timing threshold for sampling motion. And then perhaps that same DVR had cameras that at the same time, or just in moments later, were given priority for motion based on whatever decision somebody made. And so it stopped encoding images from the lower priority camera in the gym and elsewhere. And oh, then, I see what you mean. It takes, so not all of them will be working at the same time? It, it takes- No, they don't. Yeah, they never do. So here's- Okay. Let me give you a quick analogy, right? Now that makes sense, okay. yes. Okay, so let's say you have a DVR with 10 cameras, okay? Uh-huh. And, and the DVR has a maximum ability to encode 120 images per second. That, that, um, those uh, samples, we call them, mm -hmm. have to be allocated among those 10 cameras. And let's say there's no motion sensitivity. So what you get is you get each camera with the ability to encode 12 frames per second. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And, and the sampling isn't like all of a sudden snapshot all 12 cameras, all 10 cameras encode an image at the same moment in time. That's not um, how it works. That's, so you get, you, you basically get, um, a, an image sample from one camera and milliseconds later, another camera in the sequence will then start to sample. And so they're usually always a few milliseconds off because they, you just don't have the bandwidth to encode and process images from 10 cameras at the same moment in time. It's a lot of information. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's usually kind of a snap, 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 all 10 cameras in, you know, 12 times in that one second. So you're really, you're really looking at something where um, the DVR is sampling a, a camera, a new camera every four thousandth of a second, four milliseconds. Okay, does everybody understand what he just mentioned? If not, I will put it in layman's terms for you. There are certain cameras that will take priority or precedence over other cameras during certain times of the day. And it really does make sense to me now that during lunchtime, the cameras in the cafeteria are going to be taken more footages and record and snapshots because there's a certain amount that they can take per frame than the ones in the gym because they're not expecting kids to be in the gym at that time. Now I'm going to put a nice little disclaimer right now because I know I'm going to piss some people off just with what I'm going about to say next. I don't like to sensationalize things or have conspiracy theories. I really like to base my theories on facts that I can manage to gather. But take a look here, at 11.18, Kendrick is alive and well in the cafeteria just getting his food. And I've had several frames of him in the cafeteria, you know, getting his food on that day. So I know he's alive and well then, and he's exactly where he should be, in the cafeteria having lunch. So if we know he's alive and well in the cafeteria at 11.18, during the quote-unquote missing time in the gym, I have a plethora of new questions. And I would really like to see the footages from outside of the old gym. There's security footages there. And I would like to see who's going in and out of that hallway, not from inside the hallway of, you know, G9. I would like to see outside. And other questions are, who was absent from third block? Who was absent from fourth block? Who was absent from school that whole day that wanted to act like they have an alibi and just sneak in, possibly? Captain Jones did say that they interviewed everyone on the video cameras as I asked him about the kids that were following in from G9. But to leave no stone unturned, I wonder if they interviewed anyone that didn't go to school that day, per alibi. When he calls me back, I will definitely ask him that and I'll update you about that later. Now forgive me because I'm a little bit salty at this point trying to figure this shit out, but I went ahead and found Scott Forth's email. 
Well, who's Scott Forth, you ask? He is the Senior Information Technology Technician for Lowndes County School District. And I could not find one damn picture of this guy, so this is the best I got. And I asked him very specific questions so I can get very specific answers. I've been checking my email every day to see if he's responded, but honestly, I don't think he will. And if he does, it probably will be something very vague if he does. So I'm not expecting a whole lot back from him, but if he does, I will definitely update you with that information. Someone that I haven't heard of, but I actually came across was Owen Prince. Now he's the director of information technology at Lowndes County. He's been there for a while also. I'm not sure if he's been there as long as Scotty has, but I ended up just emailing him the same exact thing, just switching a few words around to make it so it's personal to him. But I literally just asked the same questions. I will say this, Scott Forth and or Owen Prince could have been the first and only people to review the footages. I've only read about Scott Forth in the reports. I've never heard of Owen Prince, but I just took a shot in the dark and decided to see if maybe he knew something as well. So if anybody really knows the answers to what we're trying to ask, it's probably most likely them. And if you didn't read my email that I had just posted, you know, I did ask them a very good question. I said, was it altered because you didn't want that to be leaked to the press? Or was there just nothing there at all? That's something we need to be asking. I wanted to wrap this up a little bit, but I also wanted you all to know what to look forward to. Anyone that's already familiar with Kendrick's case, trust me when I'm saying I'm going to go over everything that you've probably already heard of before, and I will do it very thoroughly, and I'm going to add things that you probably haven't heard of either. And as dark as my soul is, I'm going to be as respectful as I can to each party involved. There are several parties involved, several families involved, and these are people, whether you like them or not. Anyone that would like to share any thoughts or interesting topics about his case, feel free to email me at crimegeekchannel at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for watching. Stay tuned for more, but until then, stay safe, geeks.